Hi, I'm Dan Weiser, the Artistic Director, co-founder of Classicopia. Uh, President Marsha Colligan and I would love to welcome you uh, to our uh, second of these uh, three Jewish programs we're doing here in September, uh, filled with so many wonderful uh, pieces of music exploring the music of the Jewish tradition. Um, uh, this uh, program is called uh, Music of Reflection, uh, and it uh, has a, a meditative quality to it. We're going to have the wonderful Francis and Emmanuel Borofsky with us on uh, violin and cello, uh, along with uh, Cantor Ben Ellerin from the Baltimore Hebrew Congregation, uh, who will sing uh, one song by Ned Rohrm with us. Sit back and enjoy this wonderfully reflective, meditative program. Our first piece today is a beautiful Kaddish for violin and piano written by Maurice Ravel, who was not a Jewish composer, but was very interested in folk music from around the world, um, uh, Greek music and uh, Japanese music, um, Spanish music. And uh, he had gone to some services uh, in uh, 1913, uh, Jewish services, and was deeply moved by what he saw. Uh, and so he wrote this Kaddish originally for voice and piano, but he also uh, transcribed it for violin and piano. Uh, Ravel was, uh, his father was Swiss and his mother was Basque. Uh, Stravinsky once called him the most perfect of Swiss, Swiss watchmakers. Uh, and that's, uh, he was very precise and detailed and perfectionist. In fact, he only wrote about 60 pieces altogether because he often worked on them for years at a time. He once said, I did my work slowly, drop by drop. I tore it out of me by pieces. Uh, but thankfully, he loved what he did. As he once said, the only love affair I have ever had was with music. Here's Ravel's beautiful Kaddish. <laughs> Thank you. 
We now bring to the stage Frances Borowski on cello, and she will do a solo Bach suite, the Sarabande from his third suite in C major. Uh, Bach, uh, one of the greatest of all of our composers, um, as Debussy once said, Bach is a benevolent God whom all musicians should offer a prayer to defend themselves against mediocrity. And uh, Schumann said, studying Bach convinces us that we are all idiots. Music owes as much to Bach as any religion to its founder. Uh, and uh, these are all, these cello suites were written around 1722, and they are some of the most spiritually reflective music of all time. Please enjoy one of the Bach uh, Sarabans from Bach Suite number three. We're now going to play the slow movement from uh, Felix Mendelssohn's uh, Trio in D minor, written in 1839. Uh, Mendelssohn was born 
uh, in a wonderful family, of course, his father, Moses Mendelssohn, was considered the father of Reform Judaism. Uh, he was a, a hunchback from Dessau ghetto who had come to Berlin by the power of his own intellect. Moses had sort of made his way in society there in Berlin, uh, trying to make sure that Jews could assimilate better into society. And his son, Abraham, uh, was uh, very successful as a banker. Uh, Abraham used to say, I am a human sandwich. For many years, I was known as the son of my father, and then I was known as the father of my son. But Felix grew up, uh, along with his sister Fanny, who we'll hear soon after this, uh, grew up in this incredible home where they would have these Sunday soirees with great music and the who's who uh, of German society, including uh, Jacob Grimm, E.T.A. Hoffmann, Ludwig Tieck, Hegel, Heine, uh, Weber, uh, everybody would come to this home. And so uh, Mendelssohn was one of the great prodigies writing incredible music when he was eight and nine years old. Um, they were, of course, born Jewish, but uh, in 1816, uh, Abraham and his wife Leah decided to convert uh, all the children, Felix Fanny and two others. Uh, there had been a votum issued by the Prussian Ministry of Finance in 1816 with the following statement. It would be desirable not to have any Jews at all in the country. We must tolerate those we already have, but at the same time, we must try constantly to render them as inoffensive as possible. The conversion of Jews to the Christian religion must be facilitated, and all civil rights must be linked to their conversion. But as long as a Jew remains Jewish, he cannot obtain a position in the state. And soon after, uh, Abraham wrote a really fascinating letter to Fanny, um, describing uh, what they had to go through in this conversion. Uh, he wrote the following, Dear Fanny, does God exist? What is God? Is a part of ourselves eternal? Does it live on after the other parts are gone? And if so, where and how? I don't know the answers to any of these questions and have never taught you anything concerning them. But I do know that there exists in me and in you and in all men an eternal tendency to everything that is good, true, and right, and that a conscience exists which admonishes us and guides us and lives in this belief. I know this. I believe in it. Uh, it is my religion. Um, that is all I can tell you about religion, all that I know. The form in which your religious instructor has conveyed it to you is historical. Like all the creations of mankind, it is changeable. Several thousands of years ago, the Jewish form was the dominant one, then the pagan, now it is the Christian. We, your mother and I, were born in Judaism and raised in it by our parents. And without having had to change this form, we have followed the God in ourselves and our own consciences. We have raised you and your brothers and sisters in Christianity because it is the form of religion accepted by most civilized men and contains nothing that might lead you away from the good. On the contrary, much that guides you towards love, towards obedience, towards tolerance, and towards resignation, even if only in the example of the author of the religion, an example recognized by so few and followed by even fewer. And Mendelssohn uh, didn't like the change to the Christian name Bartholdi that his father took and uh, often published without that name. Uh, and Abraham uh, admonished him. At one point he said, there can no more be a Christian Mendelssohn than there can be a Jewish Confucius. Uh, and so ultimately, uh, Abraham, when he dies, Mendelssohn does sometimes use the Bartholdi name. Uh, but this uh, piece he wrote actually under Felix Mendelssohn, a beautiful trio. Here's the slow movement from the D minor trio from 
We now move to Felix's sister Fanny, uh, who has sadly been largely forgotten as a composer and was not encouraged by either her parents or even her brother Felix during her lifetime to publish uh, the music that she wrote. And she wrote over 400 works, uh, including this trio that she wrote at the very end of her life. In fact, it was the, one of the last pieces she wrote uh, and it was uh, left unpublished until her brother would publish it uh, as a, an, in honor of her early death at the age of 41 from a stroke. Uh, Fanny grew up in that, that same environment as Felix, uh, but uh, it was clear that this was not going to be her profession. Her father wrote her a letter in 1820. Um, Music will perhaps become Felix's profession, but for you it can and must only be an ornament, never the root of your being and doing. Uh, and then a few years later, he encouraged her to get going on her family uh, and uh, a child. Uh, he said, uh, you must improve, you must become more steady and collected and prepare yourself more earnestly and eagerly for your real calling, the only calling of a young woman that is the state of a housewife. Women have a difficult task, the constant occupation with the apparent trifles, the interception of each drop of rain that it may not evaporate but be conducted into the right channel uh, and spread wealth and blessing, the unremitting attention to every detail, the appreciation of every moment and its improvement for some benefit or other, all these and more are the weighty duties of a woman. Uh, she ultimately even asked Felix if it would be okay for her to publish when the father dies. Uh, he writes to her mother that he doesn't think that's a great idea. As he wrote, Fanny possesses neither the inclination nor the calling for authorship. She is too much a woman for that, as is proper and looks after her house. Uh, but at the same time she, that he wrote that, she was writing to a friend, when one never encounters either objective criticism or goodwill, one eventually loses the critical sense needed to judge one's work while at the same time losing the wish to create it. I am thus more or less alone with my music. Ultimately, in 1846, she does decide to publish some pieces, um, and writes a, a scared letter to her brother saying, I hope I won't disgrace all of you through my publishing. I trust you will in no way be bothered by it. I proceeded completely on my own in order to spare you any possible unpleasant moment. Um, and unfortunately, just a couple months after this, uh, she would die at early death. And thankfully, Felix published this piece soon after. Here is a slow movement from her trio in D minor.
We're now going to bring in cantor Ben Ellerin to do uh, one song by Ned Rohr called uh, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening uh, with beautiful poetry by Robert Frost. Uh, Rohr uh, is uh, considered one of the best composers of art songs and certainly one of the best American composer of those songs. He wrote over 500 of them, uh, won a Pulitzer Prize in 1976. Um, he was born in uh, Richmond, Indiana in 1923, uh, and his piano teacher at the time introduced him to Debussy and Ravel, uh, and he said the experience forever changed his life. He loved the harmonies, the impressionistic harmonies and the colors. Uh, he ultimately attended Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, uh, and after World War II, uh, he spent uh, about 10 uh, years in France uh, and sort of knew all of the artists and who's who there and wrote a, a journal about his days there that uh, exposed a lot of uh, crazy things happening. Uh, he has a wonderful quote. He once said, why do I write music? Because I want to hear it. It's as simple as that. Others may have more talent, more sense of duty, but I compose just from necessity and no one else is making what I need. Uh, here's his song, Stopping by Woods on a Snow Evening uh, by Ned Rohr. We're now going to play a piece by Claude Debussy, who was so influential for Rorum. Uh, Debussy is one of the first bad boys of uh, music. Uh, he sort of d purposely broke all the rules uh, as a young boy while attending the Paris Conservatory as one of their very talented young people, born in 1862. Um, but he really just thought that uh, music was being stifled by all the rules that they had to learn about which chord could go to which chord and which harmonies made sense together. And uh, as he once said, some people wish above all to conform to the rules. I wish only to render what I can hear. There's no theory. You only have to listen. Pleasure is the law. And that sort of opened up the floodgates to a lot of crazy things that happened in the 20th century, although Debussy's music is sort of now more like Claude Monet's Impressionism, radical at the time, but so beautiful to listen to now. Uh, he also said, I love music passionately, and because I love it, I must free it from the barren traditions that stifle it. Um, and so much of Debussy's music, not this piece in particular, but his later music, 
is filled with these silences. And for Debussy, that was so important. As he once said, uh, music is the silence between the notes. Uh, one of my favorite quotes of all time, he wrote an opera, uh, Peleus and Melisan, that was not hugely successful. Uh, but uh, he once said, in opera, there is always far too much singing. Um, and the piece we're going to play is actually a very early work, written in 1880, just after he left conservatory and was actually working in Russia for Nadazhda von Meck, uh, teaching her children. Uh, you might recognize that name. Nadazhda von Meck was the patron of Tchaikovsky, who gave him lots of money, um, but uh, said that Tchaikovsky could never actually see her in return for that. Um, and uh, so through, uh, through Nadezhda von Meck, Debussy uh, knew a lot about what was going on with Tchaikovsky at the time. Um, but we think he wrote this piece there in Russia. And it was lost for many years. It wasn't discovered for about 100 years. Uh, found in 1982 and then not published until 1986. And it is a very youthful piece. It doesn't sound like Debussy's impressionism that we know. Some have called it sweet, sentimental, and sugary, verging on salon music. Um, but we thought the third movement of this was perfect uh, for reflection and absolute beauty. Here's Debussy's trio in G major, the slow movement.
Our next work is written by Elizabeth Borowski, the elder sister to Emmanuel and Francis. Uh, she uh, grew up in Baltimore area, but now lives up in New Hampshire. Um, and she wrote this uh, piece. Uh, this is the second movement of a piece called the Kessel Suite, written for a man named Martin Kessel, who actually runs a concert series up in New Hampshire, um, but has lived in South Africa and Israel and America. Uh, and he met Elizabeth and, uh, for his 80th uh, birthday. Uh, his wife commissioned this piece, uh, which sort of explores in different movements uh, the life of uh, Martin Kessel, who was a biologist, a microbiologist as well. Um, and this middle movement is called Israel, and you'll hear little uh, snippets of the Hatikva in it, uh, and just the fun spirit of Martin Kessel. Here is Israel from Martin Kessel Suite by Elizabeth Borowski. <laughs> piece tonight is uh, from uh, Paul Schoenfield's Cafe Music, one of my favorite uh, modern trios uh, written in uh, 1985. And uh, Schoenfield was born in 1947 in Detroit, uh, studied with some great pianists uh, and uh, was a wonderful pianist, but ultimately uh, decided to give up music for a while and actually lived on a kibbutz in Israel uh, teaching mathematics. Um, but uh, he ultimately came back to America, I believe he now teaches at the University of Michigan. Um, and uh, the idea of the cafe music came about uh, when he went to a Murray's Steakhouse in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, he had sat in one night for the pianist of the, the trio that performed there every night, playing a wide assortment of music. Um, and he said, my intention uh, with cafe music was to write a kind of high class dinner music, music which could be played at a restaurant but also just barely might find its way into a concert hall. Uh, this work draws on the many types of music played by the trio at Murray's, 
uh, 20th century American, Viennese, light classical, gypsy, and Broadway are all represented. And in the second movement, there's a paraphrase of a beautiful Hasidic melody, which you will hear in this gorgeous second movement. Uh, one of the quotes uh, about his music, um, this is by um, Klaus Roy, who said, Paul Schoenfeld writes the kind of inclusive and welcoming music that gives eclecticism a good name. He draws on many of ethnic sources in his music, assimilating them into his own distinct distinctive language. His grasp of music history joins hands with popular and folk traditions of America and beyond. This is crossover art achieved with seamless craftsmanship. We hope you enjoy the second movement of Paul Schoenfeld's Cafe Music.
and thanks for being a part of this. Uh, and uh, we have another classic Copia concert of Jewish music coming up. It's called The Jewish Spirit, featuring uh, the Shostakovich Piano Trio, one of the most powerful pieces ever written, written during World War II. Uh, and it really explores some of the, the horrors uh, that Shostakovich knew uh, was going on around him. So um, take care, and uh, thanks for being a part of another classic Copia program. We'll see you soon.